Well, ladies and gentlemen, I must say I hadn't expected this start, but this is a nice um, uh, start of the session that we will have this afternoon on IT applications related to mobility in the stream of mobility, uh, as you know, one of the six stream here at uh, 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 the conference. Um, I would like to um, introduce to the floor the, the five speakers, although we are missing the last speaker, Mr. Qian, Professor Qian from Taiwan. Uh, we haven't met uh, yet. We hope he will uh, be here, but we have. At first, Bob Ransdorf from TomTom Tom in the Netherlands. Take a seat, uh, Bob. I think the, that one over there. Then we have Ayman Smadi. Thank you. <laughs> Ayman Smadi. Uh, the director of the, for the Middle East and North Africa of uh, the International uh, 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 Association of uh, Public uh, Transport. Then we have Enrique Dominguez, the founder of uh, El Parking uh, in, uh, uh, from Spain. And we have Inranzo Allende, marketing analyst for CT, uh, uh, ZTE Enterprises in uh, uh, China. And we hope to meet also our uh, a Taiwanese uh, uh, colleague. Well, uh, having said that, uh, it, it's clear that we, have, we choose to have a session where we are starting to think about the help that IT could offer in managing an organization uh, um, uh, and organizing mobility in your city. You will receive a, a spectrum uh, of insights uh, from uh, the distinguished speakers. Two of them will be a little bit broader, uh, Bob Ramsdorp and Ayman uh, uh, Smadi, and three will go more into depth, two times on parking and one time on uh, fatigue and the prevention of uh, fatigue and risk that that uh, uh, gives for, uh, for drivers. So that is what I would like to say. I have to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, my name is Hans Jekyll. I am from the Netherlands. The program is mentioned Belgium. Good friends of us, no problem. Uh, I'm uh, the professor in uh, smart mobility, the societal uh, aspects of smart mobility of uh, Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. And I'm also the chairman of the Association of European Transport, which organizes the European Transport Conference, which was here in Barcelona a month, um, uh, a month ago. A little bit smaller conference than this one, but also one which is very interesting to be, I must, um, I must say. I have to tell you a, a, a few things because there is some interaction. All speakers get eight minutes to present their story, which is very short, but that did mean, this means that we still have some time for you to ask questions. But I have to tell you a little bit how it works. It's about logistics. You all have to take out, to take your smartphones. I'm going to do this a little bit slow and to connect to the Wi-Fi, the Huawei Connect. I hope you've undo all done that. Then you open the SCEWC app, SCEWC app, and click on the Ask and Vote option. Well, there is a possibility that this succeeds. There's also a possibility that this not succeed. And when it not succeeds, then you um, um, open the web browser and go to www.smart.smartcityexpo.com slash ask and vote. And the end is with this signal, this difficult signal. Well, then you still have to do one thing. When you're this far, find our session, our session uh, ITS and mobility uh, on the list, and you're ready to participate. So what you can do is you uh, can present to us your question. And I will get a, a, a wrap up of all the questions and a, a ranking of the questions uh, within some uh, a half an hour from now, so that I can see what is mostly asked, what type of questions, so that we can I can bring those questions to the four the three distinguished uh, speakers. Well, having said that, I, I think we now have to start because 
you don't want to listen to me, but you want to listen to them. Uh, Bob, can I give you the floor? Bob is the general manager from Tom Tom City, comes uh, from the Netherlands and will explain a little bit more himself. Mr. Jekyll, thank you for the introduction. Um, what I'm going to tell you in, in only eight minutes, and I see that we're already over time, um, is a little bit about traffic management and the way how TomTom sees that nowadays, um, what it was in the past, how we think we can help cities, and what we actually see uh, in the future, uh, because there are a lot of things changing. Um, I need to stand here, of course. Or can I use this microphone as well? Sure. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Good. I always like to walk around, actually. Um, so, like I mentioned already, um, traffic management, how it is currently being done uh, for the last decades, let's say. Um, what we think is going to happen starting tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, and is actually already happening as well. And what will be happening in, in the future, uh, after tomorrow. A um, little bit, so how traffic management always has been done. Um, traffic management was always focused on, let's say, collecting data and controlling drivers. Um, collecting data in ways of measuring vehicles via loop detectors, uh, automatic uh, uh, license plate registration cameras, um, and, and Bluetooth tracking. The thing with these things is um, that it is, um, it costs a lot of money for maintenance, for installing them, um, and they have a lot another limitation. They're not f covering all roads, um, and therefore it is a limited, let's say, it's not, it's not that effective as it can be. Also in terms of influencing traffic, or traffic management authorities, they have been trying to influence drivers, controlling the traffic by influencing the drivers via these displays, these VMS displays as we call them, um, radio messages and traffic information via RDS-TMC. Again, it has limitations. Limitations as being that you're not able to reach all drivers because of the technique, um, and even not all drivers are actually watching or getting your messages. So again, you have limitations in terms of collecting data, but also trying to control the traffic. Now, about 10 years ago, when um, GPS became freely commercially available, uh, TomTom started to collect GPS data. Nowadays, we get GPS data from more than 450 million cars driving around the world. Uh, every five seconds, we're collecting 40,000 kilometers of road data, um, which basically gives you eyes on the road. It, instead of looking at the traffic, you're becoming part of the traffic. And this gives you the ability to, to really start um, having traffic management on all the roads. Um, since I only have... Okay, I have a little bit more. That's good. Uh, good. Um, since I have a little bit more time, but still I need to rush through, I'm going to focus on traffic management 2.0. I will quickly touch base on 3.0, but then I want to actually uh, um, showcase you a platform that TomTom Tom started, which is called TomTom Tom City, uh, which is a platform that tries uh, to connect cities with their citizens, with their drivers, um, in order to, to influence traffic in a better way how we try to actually help cities with their traffic management. Um, which is basically traffic management 2.0. Um, so it is really working together as various stakeholders in order to have one information stream to the driver. Because in our view, the driver, he's causing the problem, so he's by facto the problem, but he's also the solution. Um, so basically that's what I'm saying here. <laughs> I'm ahead of my slides. Um, so with traffic management 2.0, if, if you connect all of these stakeholders, then you get to really influence the routing of these drivers, optimize your traffic management um, by, by really 
talking to those drivers in the car instead of out the car. And that gives you really uh, um, a good way to uh, influence traffic and optimize your traffic management. Um, you even get a good view on a historical database, you know, what has happened. You can do analysis for that, um, which gives you again a great view of what has happened and how you can optimize your scenarios for your traffic management or even investment plans, whatever you can do. Um, so like identifying bottlenecks, that's actually an example of that. Like I mentioned, in the former traffic management 1.0, it was limited to a certain amount of roads because you cannot equip all roads with cameras, with detection loops, etc. Um, if you start to measure cars, vehicles, then you actually have all roads covered because these cars are driving on all roads and you get information about that. So that is one of the advantages of using floating car data, as we call it. GPS is a part of that, but we also have other data coming in. Um, and it enforces you to have regional collaboration. Um, for example, take the city of Barcelona. There are some highways here which are probably being operated by someone else than the city of Barcelona. But they are connected. So if one takes an action, they should know what the effect is, example, on the streets of Barcelona. With GPS data, with this vast amount of data, you are able to follow the traffic. You have eyes on all the roads. Um, quickly on 3.0, this is a potential scenario, um, meaning that with the introduction of more and more autonomous driving vehicles, this can actually happen. There are a lot of scenarios that can happen, but this is one of them. So traffic management, again, needs to change in the future. We're not sure how that is going to look like, uh, look like but these are some scenarios which can happen. Um, they all can decrease traffic, which is good, you know, less congestion, good for the economy, good for the people, good for everyone. Um, but traffic management needs to really step up and change itself again in order to come to, down to these scenarios. Now, I only have three and a half minutes. Um, it's, it's even more? It's mi oh, really? I see three and a half here. <laughs> um, so therefore, I quick can I go back to these? Can I go back to this microphone again? Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, what I want to do is I want to switch actually to a platform which we created and launched last April. Um, it's city.tomtom.com or TomTom City, but the URL is city.tomtom.com. It's freely available, you can access it as well. We now have uh, 100 cities being covered there. Um, let me try to show you which ones. So a lot of European ones. Uh, but we're covering 52 countries. Um, so we have all over the world cities that are joining this program. Uh, but let's, let's go to, oh, it's the wrong button. Let's go to Barcelona. So with this data, we're able to provide cities uh, traffic information, real-time traffic information, like traffic flow, what you see currently here, what is happening right now in, in Barcelona, um, what kind of jams there currently are. Um, you can actually analyze where are the biggest bottlenecks in each quarter of the year um, to get really detailed information. And that all can be done with just a few clicks um, because of automated algorithms that we have running in the back that every 30 seconds get this data and transform that into traffic information um, which can really help traffic management. Um, that's the way how we think in, at TomTom that we should move on with traffic management, connecting all the stakeholders. Um, can I switch back again? Thank you. Um, to connect all the stakeholders 
being the driver, the service providers, and the cities being the road authorities, and to really improve the communication to the driver so that he's optimized uh, in his taking his actions, which then will decrease congestion, which will improve the traffic management. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Thank you, uh, uh, Bob, for uh, this uh, presentation. We're a little bit wrong uh, with this one. Can you put it again uh, in the back? Can you put it again on eight uh, minutes? Thank you. Um, and uh, a warm welcome uh, to you, Professor uh, uh, Chiang. You're not going to present uh, yet. You can just sit a little bit uh, 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 quiet and listen to uh, uh, the presentation of uh, Ayman uh, Smadi. But it's, it's nice that you are here. I introduce you in a few moments. But first I introduce uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Smadi, who is going to talk and to bring us from Barcelona in eight minutes. Well a little bit too fast probably, to the city of Oman in Jordan, uh, where he has worked and where he did uh, a comprehensive uh, transport uh, plan. You have the floor. And I hope you now have eight minutes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, we'll go quick. Um, actually, I just switched jobs uh, last month. I was telling my colleagues uh, I was the director of transport for the city of Amman for about eight years. Uh, and move to an international organization, UITP, um, and it's, it's a lot easier actually to, to be uh, on the other side. Um, so, um, you know, you, you don't get blamed about all the traffic problems that Bob talked about. And, and I'm going to take you from the dream that Bob drew uh, to the reality of being in a city and having to deal with, um, you know, we had 1.3 million cars uh, in Amman. The city itself had really exploded in, with population due to the regional conflict. I'm sure you're aware of you know, the problems in Syria and Iraq, which meant that the population of Amman went from 2.4 million to about 4.5 million in less than three years. Um, so in addition to the increase um, in th on the demand for mobility, we also have some cultural problems that people are not you know, used to the city, they're not oriented to the city, how they use its transport system. Um, something that is also very common in the Middle East and North Africa region is that we have a huge percentage of the population that is below the age of 25. In fact, the largest segment is under 18, which means that we still have a lot of demand for mobility in the coming years as these youngsters, they enter the job market and they become uh, you know, more economically and socially active. Um, so this is, like I said, very common uh, within the, the MENA region. Uh, the problem in Amman, again, you know, with, with, the, with the rapid increase in population, and also we were very comfortable, uh, you know, catering for cars, uh, which meant that we had 7% to 8% incre annual increase in the number of vehicles owned. And this is something, unfortunately, that's not explained by the incomes of the population or the infrastructure of the city. So the infrastructure of the city couldn't really keep up. And we had much better public transport 25 and 30 years ago than we have today. So how do you really address this looking at, the, at this pie chart that shows the modest public transport mode share of 13 percent? Um, and, and the walking, by the way, even though it's a large segment, this is really mostly pupils, school children going to school within the zone itself. So most of the real trips are taking place uh, by cars. Uh, of course, this translates into tremendous uh, you know, travel time costs, fuel costs, in addition to pollution. The, the traditional approach within the city itself took you know, the sort of like the rational approach. We had to develop public transport as a real alternative for people so that they can... But of course, this takes time. So while we address that, while we, we work on mass transit systems, we needed to address the day-to-day -day problems of traffic because people are driving and they don't care if I have a public transport uh, project that's going to take three years. They see it every day, especially when you talk about bus rapid transit system. They want it to be done yesterday. And, and, th and they think that we are crazy to take a lane out of already a busy road that has 100 or 150,000 cars per day. They, they think that we should add uh, more lanes. So we began right away looking at some technology. Uh, I'm sorry. Looking at technology. Looking at, well, again, I want to go down. OK, thank you. So. Um, 
you know, the, this, this one project that we're looking at, which is the BRT, the Bus Rapid Transit Project, we hope that it will actually introduce new services and technologies that would at least help people imagine how things could be. Because today when they are sitting in traffic, they cannot really relate to what we are trying to do. What is the plan? So the BRT project will introduce universal solutions such as traveler information system, payment systems that will include door-to-door -door service so that we, when people are using the feeder services, they actually have the same level of service as the BRT. But at the same time, we are working on some cool stuff that I wanted to share. And, and we, we found a lot of excitement from people when we, you know, when we dabble with some initiatives that relate to the environment. For instance, because people love cars, we thought if we have 1.5 million cars in Jordan, even if uh, a modest percentage of these cars is replaced with electric vehicles, then we could save a lot of fuel we could also uh, you know, save the emissions on the environment, and also the operating cost of these vehicles are much less than the regular vehicles. And Jordan, for those of you who don't know, we're very energy poor, so in this case, we're actually using renewable energy, solar uh, power generation, so that we can power the charging stations, and then you know, the cars will run on electricity. So we began by doing a project in the downtown area where we allocated a very, very important and prime spot in the downtown area where people can't park, and this is where we have the electric vehicles uh, as taxis, and people can use them uh, to finish their trips within the downtown area. Um, we also work with ITS in, a, in, you know, in some enforcement, cameras, uh, but more importantly, what we are looking at or employing is the mobile-based uh, technologies. So we're doing two things that are worth sharing. First of all, the NFC, the payment uh, method, um, th through um, the Central Bank of Jordan, we're using these NFC tags with a tablet on buses. We did a pilot on 20 buses that provides us the location so I can get the tracking. I also can provide the information to the users, and I develop a platform where the users can pay on multiple modes. And I'm also using the same technology for parking. So then I'm creating this, this uh, platform that can be utilized for different services. In fact, this also has a social dimension because the Jordanian society is very cash-oriented. And, and many people don't have bank accounts or credit cards. So to actually get them to use these services with e-money, if you will, this is, this is a real you know, cultural uh, conversion in a way. Um, so um, to conclude, I think you know, it's very important for the city to integrate. Um, you know, yes, it's, it's good to, to work with technology, but really how to get the functions of the city, everything that is related to different transit services, to, to benefit from, for instance, LED streetlights, because we have Wi-Fi uh, on the poles, how do we benefit from that for transport uh, information? So definitely we have to take advantage of, of these innovations and the user expectations, something that, that I was always struggling with, I had a Twitter account, I called it GAM Transport. And when people sent comments or requests for services, they expected that the actual work will be done with the same speed that I responded to their tweet. So if I, if I responded and I said, I will send my guys to look at it, then the next morning they're actually telling me that you know, it's been eight hours and nothing has been done. And they don't realize the structure in an organization that has 22,000 people to actually get the guys to go and work and, and depending on the nature of the work. And, and for us in the, in the Middle East and North Africa region, it's very important to have success stories, especially when, when we relate to public transport. Because public transport is still you know, something that we are trying to introduce and change the behavior and the attitudes of citizens toward it. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Smadi. I think the, the common denominator in the two stories is, is, is more or less the, the IT in relation to the expectation of the users. Um, Bob Ransdo have said, um, uh, yeah, the drivers are the problem, but also uh, the, the solution. Uh, so we expect a lot uh, from drivers, but they expect a lot from city uh, managers. And that became even more clear in uh, the presentation uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, Amman, where a, a whole 
series of IT applications um, is uh, now being used. Having said that, we now move to the three more in-depth uh, themes. We will start with two presentations on parking. Uh, two different presentations on parking, uh, uh, I know. And uh, we will start uh, with um, Enrique Dominguez from El Parking in uh, uh, Spain. Enrique, you have the floor. Thank you and uh, hello to everyone. Well, I am the founder of uh, El Parking. El Parking um, is a, uh, wants to be like a pl platform for making the life easier for the drivers in the cities. When we are talking uh, about cities, we are talking about problems. And there are many of the problems in the cities already solved in more or, or in, 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 a, in, a, in any way, more or, or less. But in the four parkings, we have a very, very, uh, a very important problem to solve. Well, the, um, when you uh, get the car in a city like Barcelona or a city like Madrid, uh, you have to think about uh, five or ten minutes only for parking. Because when you get uh, the place you, uh, you already met, uh, or you are going to meet somebody, you have to, to take into account that you have to park. And in these uh, cities, we have um, uh, on the street parking, we have to pay for parking in, in, the, in, the, from in, in, the, in the week, in the working week. And we have already apps uh, for our mobiles to, uh, to help us to put the ticket in the car and to park uh, quickly. But uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a cheap solution. It's not always available. There are days uh, when the pollution is very high and the government is stopping us to, uh, to, uh, to allow us to, to park in the, in the city. So we have to use the, the private parking, the off-street parking. Well, the uh, parking wants to be a smart system that let the user uh, use their mobile apps to provide solutions for parking. Uh, we put together on-street and off-street uh, parking available in one platform. We, we get your credit card in our, in our app and you can use it to pay on-street and off-street. This, this is basically what, what we do. We have already more than 300,000 uh, citizens, drivers, using our app. Uh, we, have, we, are, we are present in more than 50 cities in Spain. The main one is Madrid, and we want to, to extend this service to, uh, to many, many more cities. Um, we, uh, using this, this app in the last two years, we have uh, collected a lot of data, and we are using it to help the citizens to park better. We give this uh, information to public entities to know where, where, is the, where are uh, the, the parking available, and to help the, them to lead the drivers to the, to the proper zones. We are helping also parkings, the off-street parkings, to allow them to do yield management in their, in their businesses, like the hotels and, or restaurants do, to uh, in increase, well, more decrease the price when the, when the demand is low, and to help the people to park better. We help also the drivers to not only to pay, also to know where is the where is the, the parking available and to go directly to the parking. And, uh, and at the end, we are trying to help the driver to the park, to park better. For the citizens, we are covering the area in, in, in those cities. I mentioned the, the, those 15, 50 cities to more than uh, 7 million uh, population. With this solution, we try to um, offer an, an easy alternative to the parkimeter in the in the on-street parking, and an easy an easy uh, solution in the off-street parking also. Because when, when you go, for example, to a parking and you want to pay, you have to look for the for the floor where the the parking uh, system. The, uh, I'm sorry, the the paying system is uh, installed. You have to see if if it's running because sometimes it's not. If they allow credit card, 
and finally to pay to go back to the car, get the, the ticket and, and go out. With our solution, you only go with the, your car, you park, you go out, then you go back to, your, to get your car, you go out from the parking with your car and then it, it's uh, everything, everything done in, uh, using your mobile. Um, talking about this solution, the last one, the off-street solution, off-street parking, we are present in more than, in almost 30 cities in Spain, and the, uh, the our apps are used by our users, like 90%, uh, almost 90% of the users use it daily. I mean, it's a, it's a platform very, very used in, uh, in, uh, in our cities. And we want to uh, go abroad now. Um, for on-street parking, uh, just to let you know how often uh, we help people to park, uh, we do like 80,000 parkings per day. Uh, now we have uh, a new technology, the name is Parking Door. With this technology, it's a, it's a small device and with this, uh, with this device installed on your personal parking, you can open your parking with your door, the, the parking door with your, with your mobile phone. It's, it's uh, an advance because you forget your remote, you, you can li leave it them at home, uh, but the good thing is that you can share the, um, the permission to open the door with others um, through the internet. With this uh, invention, uh, we will start the, the, the sharing economy also in the parking. Uh, putting in common, uh, putting in the market, the private uh, parking lots of all of us. Because when you go to, uh, to your work in the center of the city, your parking at home is empty. And, and uh, the otherwise, when you, if you live in the, ci in the center of the city and you work outside, your, uh, your, your parking lot in the center of the city is, is free. And because we have uh, these main problems with, uh, with the park parking spaces, to put private parking uh, for, the, for all the public and it's, it's very important because we're giving more spaces. And we also uh, are improving the, the sharing economy. We, are now, we have now 3,000 devices of this kind installed. And the, the sharing, the, the, this sharing parking lots is already running in the center of Madrid, near the football camps. This is our current deployment, almost in all Spain. And this is the, our future. Uh, we want also to let the, the use, our users not only to use the, our mobile app, we want them to, use, to be able to use their number plates to associate the number plate with our, with our app and then to do uh, everything automatically. We want to uh, increase the number of rented, uh, private renting lots and we want to give uh, an accurate occupancy in the cities, more, accu uh, more accurate. This is one of our partners. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. interesting story which connects this stream on IT with the stream before which was more about sharing and mobility uh, and mobility services with your idea of sharing the always problems with the shortage of capacity in uh, in, in cities on uh, on parking uh, interesting uh, idea we're now going to listen to the second uh, presenter on uh, parking which is uh, Iranzo Allende from uh, the Chinese company ZTE, uh, and that company is based in Shenzhen. Uh, Mr. Mr. Allende, you have the floor. Yeah. Hello, thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here today and to introduce you one of our smart city solutions. We are going to talk today about roadside parking solutions. So let's go ahead. Okay, as you know, today it can become an entire nightmare for every driver to find a parking slot at peak hours on our street. But do you know how much time do we usually spend looking for a parking slot? Have you ever thought how it would be 
if we knew it before we approached the city center that we could find easily a parking slot? Well, there are many studies, statistics, that show that in congested cities, more than the 30% of the traffic is generated because of those drivers that they are looking for a parking slot. Between the 30 and the 70% of the cars that they are parked over there, they are not paying the correlative fee. Today's city roadside parking solution is a new way to manage the mobility, and it aims to reduce the traffic jam, the pollution caused because of those drivers, increase the incomes for the municipalities due to a better management of the incomes and penalties, and provide the best customer experience for our drivers. But what does consist of? Okay, let's sensors. Sensors, magnetic sensors that detect whether if the parking slot is available or not. This information is sent to the platform, to the Internet of Things cloud platform by the controllers. This platform will receive all the information, will collect, analyze, and provide real data to the inspectors, drivers, government. We place some uh, parking guidance boards on the streets, in main cross, in main exits. This could be released the number of parking slots that they are available in one area before we approach this area. Drivers, drivers will use an APP which can be used to share the available parking slots. When they select the preferred parking slot that it is in a specific area, they could arrive there following the instructions shown in the map in the APP. When the cars arrive there, they don't need to bring with them cash, credit card, because they can just use this APP for, par for paying the parking there. Okay, inspectors. Inspectors will bring with them some specific PDI, some specific device that could help them to verify on real time where there are these parking slots, these cars parked there without paying the correlative fee, or where are these cars that they park in a non-parking area. So which are the main components, as we explained before? Okay, detectors, magnetic detectors that we detect by the magnetic field whether the parking slot is available or not. Controllers, controllers will collect all the information and upload this information to the platform. Parking guidance boards that will be deployed and placed in main cross, main axis before approaching one specific area. And finally, the cloud-based Internet of Things platform, collected information, analyzing information, and providing this information to the end users. Parking will not be longer a problem for our drivers. They could find easily a parking slot. They could search which is the best parking slot available for them, and pay easily for parking there without the need to approach the meters that are deployed far away from the parking slot. This platform, the roadside parking system, will help to collect all those data, to analyze all those data, and to provide this information in terms of the time that our, park, our cars are parked over there, or in terms of some specific, specific statistics, studies to the government, to improve the decision making on the traffic, on the parking of the city. They could generate a better more accordingly uh, uh, for the needs of the city uh, uh, strategy planning. So the deployment of this solution could bring not only economic, social uh, s um, benefits, they could bring benefits for our inspectors, for our drivers, and for our government. As we commented, first, we will reduce the traffic jam. We will reduce the pollution caused because of those drivers. We will increase the incomes for the municipalities due to a better management of the penalties and the fee collection. This platform will collect the information for the parking, but of course that in the future can be smoothly expanded to other smart city applications. will guarantee not only the basic requirements of a smart roadside parking solution for the municipality, but also other requirements from other fields of the city, street lighting, tourists, traffic, Everyone can be in this platform, Internet of Things based platform. Drivers, of course, that we will provide the best customer experience for our drivers. Easy to park and easy to pay for parking over there. And inspectors, we will improve both the efficiency and the operation of the parking of the city. Inspectors will no longer check 
car by car, if there is any one of them that they, they didn't pay for parking there, or if there are park in some non-parking areas. This solution, of course, that has been developed in Euro, in Hungary and Romania. What we do there is that these uh, cities were uh, suffering for a big large on vehicle uh, in the city. So the heavy traffic jam was a big problem for them. Moreover, the cars parked in non-parking areas, they were so high that we could cause uh, security risks over there. The drivers in these cities, they didn't know how to could find easily a parking slot during the weekends. So by developing the solution, by placing this uh, parking guidance boards in the main cross, in the main exits to the city center, and using this APP, we improve the guidance and the, uh, the opportunity to park easily in the city center. Today, the citizens, they are going and going more often during the weekend to the city center because it's easy to find a parking slot over there. So this is everything. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Allende. I think I, I, I can would like to stress here uh, what you told about the cooperation that is, uh, that is necessary between the drivers, the inspectors, the company, the companies, uh, and, and, the, and the government to make this, uh, to make this happen. Uh, we can uh, sometimes think that, well, you are, when you only have something implemented on IT, you are there. Uh, well, as uh, city managers, you probably know that that is never the case. Now I would like to give a, a special uh, introduction uh, to you, uh, Professor uh, Xiang. Professor Xiang uh, uh, is from uh, Taiwan, uh, and he is the vice president of the uh, Kang Ning uh, uh, University. Uh, I would uh, like to, I'm happy that you're here, that you could make it. We were a little bit in doubt whether that was uh, possible, but it's good that you are here, and you're going to talk about a, a very interesting and for me, a little bit of an underrated a, a problem, the problem of fatigue. The problem of fatigue creating risks uh, with drivers, uh, risks on accidents in, uh, uh, in cities, also uh, on highways, and the way to more or less prevent fatigue. Uh, that's, uh, I think, your story. You also have only eight minutes. I'm, I can't give you more, but eight minutes, you have the floor, uh, Professor Xiang. Chairman, and uh, thank hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to share the uh, advancement of, on the sleep technology for the ITS. And uh, uh, because there is a, a very high correlation between the traffic accident and the quality of sleep, especially for the sleep disorders. And one of the sleep disorders is uh, uh, called the sleep disorder breathing, including the sleep apnea, meaning the uh, narrowing upper airway during sleep and uh, causing the obstruction of the upper airway and uh, the oxygen desaturation and uh, the interrupted uh, sleep architecture. So uh, in some statistics uh, in the United States, over 25% uh, uh, of the uh, commercial drivers have the uh, been diagnosed uh, uh, with the uh, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. And UK and in Taiwan, in our own study, uh, around 10% of the commercial driver has the uh, single sleep apnea syndrome. And also there have been several publications about the uh, uh, sleepy driver uh, uh, caused by the uh, sleep apnea syndrome can incur a higher frequency of car crashes uh, from 2-fold to 11-fold of risk of accident. And uh, the most important thing is more than 80% of the uh, sleep apnea syndrome uh, has not been uh, medically identified. And plus, in modern society, there uh, has been the chronic sleep restriction and the uh, sleep deprivation uh, related to the work schedule that could uh, multiply the effect of daytime sleepiness and fatigue. So there has been many reports uh, about the uh, air crashes, uh, including the uh, China Airlines, and with the, uh, some uh, feature story in the National Geographic, and also the Shinkansen uh, high-speed rail in Japan, 
and also uh, the M track in New York, and also the uh, the uh, high speed rail accident in Spain here, and also in France. And this is a sleepy driver caught on the street by myself in the Taipei city. I followed this car for 20 minutes because the tracking of the car was very weird and this uh, go and stop off and on. And uh, there has been many evidence show that the uh, sleep uh, disorders could uh, be even more uh, uh, dangerous uh, than the drunken drivers. And there have been data from the government of the United States. Over uh, 10,000 of traffic accidents per year are caused by the sleepy driving and uh, with uh, 15,000 deaths. And in Europe, uh, have sim similar data reported with the uh, United States. And this was a study by us uh, when I was in Stanford University. We collected uh, 35,000 uh, cases with the uh, sl uh, sleepy driver near misses evidence to predict the three uh, true traffic accident on the road. And right now we have several uh, big project collaboration with the uh, uh, Taiwan High Speed Rail, uh, which uh, has uh, uh, yearly over uh, 13 million passengers on, on the tra trend. And not only on the road and in the air, on the working construction site, uh, there has been many uh, truck drivers and uh, some uh, accidents uh, <laughs> when operating the tools and the, the, uh, the cars uh, because of the sleep problems. So the uh, ITS, uh, right now, I, we, as we know, uh, we have de be developed uh, many uh, in-car IoT in the world, but the human factor monitoring should be another uh, story, which is, will be even more uh, important. And in my book, published uh, with Springer, we uh, focus on uh, the uh, monitoring uh, by the sleep technology with the, uh, for the uh, sleepy driver. But the, the wearable uh, devices right now uh, is uh, bulky and uh, uh, although they can monitor many uh, biosignal, but uh, it's like an Iron Man. And with the advancement of wearable technology, right now we can make the Iron Man to the invisible man. And in uh, this August, the IEEE uh, e EMS, EMVC conference, I, uh, I was invited to give a lecture on the diagnosis of sleep disorders by using the textile sensors. And because of ad advancement of technology, right now the fabric, uh, fab fabric sensors could be uh, one-tenth uh, width of the human hair. So uh, in the near future, we might be uh, able to uh, detect the uh, driver's uh, distraction and the sleepiness and the fatigue in the car. But uh, another thing we need to notice that uh, clinical symptom is not always correlated to the uh, sleep quality. So uh, we need not only the uh, st statistic significant data and evidence, we need also the clinical significance <coughs> and the human factor uh, should be uh, work, working together with the I ITS. So when we come back to the uh, ma model establishment, uh, we need to uh, focus on uh, near misses uh, instead of the true accident uh, occurred, uh, which will be too late. So uh, as for the regulation, there has been uh, several uh, countries, including the United States, Canada, and the UK, they have uh, several regulations for the uh, drivers with uh, sleep, dis sleep disorders. And also, uh, the Springer invited me to uh, chief editor the Health and Wellness Industry Handbook Series, uh, this starting from this year. And there has been several uh, volumes, uh, which is uh, closely related to the uh, uh, sleepy drivers and smart city. Uh, sorry about the, the uh, misaligned because I used my le uh, MacBook, uh, not uh, compatible with the uh, the uh, PowerPoint. Sorry about that. And this was uh, also occurred in uh, IEEE in Orlando this August. 
Uh, I chair the Global Sleep and Health Technology Standard Meeting in Orlando this year with uh, many world well-known uh, experts. Uh, the standard is very important uh, to uh, have uh, a social impact. Uh, the standard right now we have uh, formed several committees to including the uh, uh, to analysis and detection of fatigue level and the, the uh, sleep technology infrastructure for smart cities and also for the uh, 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 communities. So what's next? Uh, right now we have uh, to, uh, to collect the data and the, uh, to uh, establish standard to offer the uh, uh, government to adopt for the uh, new uh, legal and the regulations. And then uh, the, the uh, transport operator and vehicle manufacturers should improve service by, uh, and develop a new business model and technology. So we need to work together from the academia and private sector and the government. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Xiang, uh, for your presentation, which um, basically is also, uh, when you look at it, about safety and IT related to, to prevention of a number of accidents, the higher elements in your pyramid and the lower elements are as important as well. Well, uh, we have still some 10 minutes uh, left, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and you see me with a tablet here. And on the tablet, uh, I can have the results from your questions. Well, there was one that came up pretty high. I think I, we can do two questions, because the second one is more, well, for discussion. Um, but, but the first one is, is a question to, um, I think, mostly to Bob, uh, Bob Ransdorp. Uh, what is the difference and in innovation in TomTom 3.0 to real-time traffic info, which is provided on Google Maps? for years. Well, you have the floor, one minute or two minutes extra. You were, the f you were the first starter with the difficult timing and so on. So I'll give you two minutes extra, but not very long extra. Good. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. Um, one remark, we were there before Google, so <laughs> we started this business. And Google was actually a customer of us for Maps. But anyhow, um, <coughs> so in 2006, we started this real-time traffic information. Um, and back then, actually, it was all about guiding the driver as fast as possible from A to B. Um, now, that has changed more to guiding the driver as still as fast as possible, but also taking more and more city objectives into account. And that is actually what we think is traffic management 2.0. 3.0, um, I'm not so sure what is going to happen. Um, yes, autonomous vehicles or self-driving vehicles, they will have a big impact on our road network, on our traffic management, on our driving behavior, on our driving patterns. Um, it's most likely actually that we will even be spending more time in the vehicle, so more kilometers will be driven. But how that is going to play out, we don't know for sure. Um, what I do expect is that the cars will be even talking more uh, to other cars. The cars will be talking more to infrastructure. And therefore, traffic management can even go to the next level where you can really, um, let's say, combine the personal goals with the uh, society goals of tra or traffic management goals. Um, but how it's going to play out, yeah, nobody knows. And, and well, <laughs> we expect that this is going to happen in, in the coming years. But please bear in mind that um, if you currently buy a car and it's not a self-driving vehicle, probably, um, unless you buy a Tesla, but also that, you know, I'm not so sure if these are already self-driving um, to, to a certain um, level they are, of course. Um, but if you buy a car, this car will probably drive for the next 20 years. So there's a, um, there's it's going to take a lot of time before we have uh, a road network that has all self-driving vehicles. So mm -hmm. there's going to be a combination. That is going to be a very interesting time, a combination of self-driving vehicles and still vehicles that need to be driven by the driver. 
Um, and yeah, how that is going to play out in traffic management 3.0, I think nobody knows. What key is, is that all the stakeholders, being the car manufacturers, service providers like TomTom Tom and cities like Barcelona, um, really start to cooperate or even intensify their cooperation in order to improve the conditions on the road there. Thank you. <coughs> now I have a question, and that I think that's the last question, and I, I must say I like the question, but it's a sort of self-reflection for all the speakers. Perhaps a little bit less for uh, Dr. Uh, Smadi, uh, because he talked somewhat broader. But the question is, why under the title mobility, it also goes back to the organizers of the, of the uh, conference, uh, um, uh, why under the title of mobility networks we talk mainly about cars? And then there are uh, something like 10 question marks uh, on that, uh, uh, after, that, uh, after that question. Who will start? <laughs> Who has already thought about this? <laughs> Bob, you start. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I had this question before. Um, and it is a good question. Um, I think we, we definitely need to start looking at mobility as a combination of, of indeed various modes of transport. Um, the reason that TomTom Tom is focusing on cars is because that's our strength, but it doesn't say that we are not looking also into the future of, of becoming a mobility service provider. Um, like I already mentioned, we are getting every five seconds, we're getting 40,000 kilometers of road data coming in from these 450 million vehicles driving out there. Um, but we also already are getting data from uh, people that are walking or uh, driving on bikes or sitting in public transport. So, um, yeah, we do want to focus more and more on becoming a mobility service provider um, and really start to connect the other transportation modes. Okay. And I think that is definitely important for a city. Who from the group of presenters? I want. Yeah. Well, cl I guess clearly, I mean... Uh we cater for cars because cars are going to be there, but, um, you know, and, and parking is probably one of the tools if we can get um, you know, to apply certain policies uh, so that we're discouraging people from, from using cars. But I want to comment on the, on the concept of mobility because um, I started working in Amman in 2008, and when I came, you know, they were building bridges and tunnels, and I say, why did we do this? And they say, well, because we had so many cars there. And I said, what are the cars doing there? Where do they come from? Where are they going to? Uh, why, are why aren't people on buses? And, and five years later, when we began implementing mass transit systems, these same structures became obstacles to public transport. These same structures became obstacles uh, to pedestrian movement. And they are still the hot points. You know, I mean, they worked for, a f for the off-peak, but during the peak when you have all these cars, uh, it doesn't really matter if you are on the top level or the lower level. But, but I think, you know, there is... Uh, value, I'm not defending Bobby and Sally, but, but there is a value in, in getting the information because there is one key component in city for city dwellers, and that is reliability. You know, I mean, it's okay if it takes me half hour every day, but if one day it takes me 50 minutes or 45 minutes, then people get, get pretty upset and, and they, they expect solutions for that. So I think at least for that component, um, because that applies to buses as well, uh, not only cars. Thank you. I uh, saw uh, Irantu also. Uh, Wanting the floor, yeah. Yeah, I think that the smart city, smart mobility is not only about the technology, it's farther than this within. So that's why we just developed an uh, uh, Internet of Things cloud platform that could integrate not only the information that is coming from one vertical, it's one platform that will collect all the information from different areas, from different fields, mobility, um, uh, energy, uh, healthcare. This platform will allow to have a better understanding for the cities, to understand really what is going on, with the requirements of the city, what they need to do for go further and improve the city for the citizens. So I think that mobility is not only about cars, about transport. I think that mobility of the city, it brings everything together. And I think that we need to understand what is going on in our city and what we could do better for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are en uh, we're entering the end of this uh, 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 session. Uh, I can wrap up. I have two minutes to wrap up. Well, I probably use one. What we heard is that IT is 
more, becoming far more helpful for solutions, mobility in cities uh, as it ever have been. On the other hand, um, probably there is something to be said about the relation to the city objectives. It, it sounds like, well, we have new interesting uh, techniques. Uh, look at the city objectives, that is important. And the dialogue between city objectives and everything that will be possible on IT is important, I, th I think, uh, to have that stressed a little bit um, uh, more even. Well, then it's clear that there are also coming up a number of sharing options on the one hand and a number of optimizing the existing capacity on the other hand, and they can, co can be combined in some way. That's a new, new sort of scope. And lastly, I think that the element of fatigue, risks coming from fatigue, has to be taken pretty serious, but that we can leave to Professor Chiang, who is really a big proponent uh, uh, for that one. Well, I would like uh, 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 to ask you a, a big applause for the group of presenters. Eight minutes is not very long, and I hope you like the session and a good conference.